This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of In Studio. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. Tonight, we are discovering Pensacola's past and how that past will affect the future. Specifically, we'll be looking more closely at Pensacola's impressive ties to Spain, the shared history that seems to become richer and deeper with each passing day. We'll be talking with the man who finally, very recently discovered the actual settlement site of Don Tristan de Luna right here in Pensacola. This is big, folks. It's being reported around the world, so we'll delve even deeper by bringing in the UWF principal investigator on the latest discovery, and then later in the hour, a community leader, who many of us know and love, will be on to tell us about a very special recognition for another famous Spaniard with incredible ties to the Gulf Coast, General Bernardo de Galvez. In studio starts right now. You've heard the news. The first multi-year European settlement in the entire nation has been positively discovered and identified right here in Northwest Florida. Well, you may think you've heard all there is to know, but in fact, the University of West Florida's renowned archaeology program is just getting started on the find. Discovered by local historian Tom Garner in October in a Pensacola neighborhood, December headlines pronounced, We Found Luna's Colony, and press conferences were held to herald the news. Joining us this evening is Tom Garner to give us the first-hand account of what happened and just how huge this news is. Tom is a Pensacola native and was once a UWF archaeology student. He discovered the archaeological site and is now a UWF research assistant and neighborhood liaison for the project. Welcome, Tom. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming on. You are kind of the man of the hour right now, kind of busy, and um, I would love for you to tell our viewers about finding the spot. Just tell us the story of how that all happened. Well, can I first say that I, I'm just astounded by this. When I found the initial artifacts, I had no idea. I never saw this coming. Um, I thought that those of us who are interested in history and archaeology would be excited and we'd huddle amongst ourselves and talk about it and the world would remain, you know, really none the wiser. But I, I read my name in a newspaper in New Zealand a couple of days ago. Wow. I, I, I just, this is just astounding to me. But anyway, so how does, how does someone find a site like this? It, it's a combination of being prepared and also being in the right place at the right time, which I think is how a lot of life is. Um, I was prepared because of two people, Dr. Judy Bentz, um, who's now the president of the University of West Florida. I took a, an archaeological field school with her 33 years ago in 1983, and we spent 12 weeks um, digging very square holes in the Escambia River drainage and learning archaeology. So I learned how to excavate properly. I learned how to process artifacts. I learned real archaeology from Judy. Um, and, and then the other person that taught me was Norman Simons. A lot of folks will remember that name. He was the curator of the Pensacola Historical Museum, which used to be in the Old Christ Church. And um, I got interested in, in identifying artifacts, and Norman sort of took me under his wing and, and taught me, got me started down that road to identifying artifacts. And so those two folks I, I, are really responsible for this discovery. Norman was the person that first, me, first told me about the Luna Expedition as well. So I stop and get a sandwich for lunch, and I decide to swing back through the neighborhood, and uh, I don't know why. It's a, it's a pretty neighborhood. I drive through there sometimes. Um, it's easier to get across traffic if you go out a different way than, than normally, and I saw this cleared lot. They'd, they'd torn down a house, and, and that's going on a lot in, in some of those older neighborhoods. They'll, they'll tear down an existing house and then build a, a new, bigger house, sure. and that's what ended up happening here. But those of us who are into archaeology, we're inherently nosy. And when we see freshly cleared ground, particularly if it's some place that, that has some potential to have some archaeology, 
we stop and look. I and, can imagine. Well, yeah, and so and so I knew this area to be one of the potential spots for the Luna Expedition. Shipwrecks aren't too far away, and so I thought to myself, well, you need to stop and look at that lot. And then I thought, no, I've got stuff to do. I don't want to stop. And then a little, my little voice told me, no, you need to stop and look, and, and I did. And I walked across the lot, and within 30 seconds, there were Spanish artifacts, you know, 1559 artifacts lying on the surface of the ground. 30 seconds? Yeah. That close to oh, the... Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, just, it was just right there for anybody to see or anybody to find. Um, I, I stopped looking at that point, understanding that it, that it could be the Luna settlement and, and alerted the University of West Florida. I called my good friend Jan Lloyd. She's the director of the archaeology lab at the university where we process the artifacts. And we've been, you know, knowing each other for, well, since I was in field school. And, so Jan, Jan alerted Elizabeth Benchley and she got a hold of John Worth and, and I hung up the phone and thought, that was it. I've done my job, right? I'm, I'm done with it. And so a few weeks later, it was like three weeks later exactly, um, I thought, huh, I wonder what happened over there with that, with that archeological site. So I drove over there and the piece of pottery that I found initially was still lying on the ground. And I was like, Oh, okay, and I, decided, I didn't know what was going on, but I decided I needed to go ahead and do what's called a surface collection. Basically, it's what it sounds like. You pick things up off the surface of the ground. And I picked up the original piece, which was a Spanish olive jar neck. Olive jar is a type of ceramic that could be from the Luna Expedition, but it could be from as late as 1800. And so I wasn't positive it was the Luna Expedition in, um, in finding that piece. That in fact, they're showing that piece on the screen right mm -hmm. now. That's, That's the original it. piece that I saw. Um, but I, in the course of doing the surface collection, I found another piece of pottery that archaeologists refer to as Columbia Plain. It's named after Columbia County, Florida, where it was first identified by American archaeologists. And when you find Columbia Plain in Pensacola, you know it's the Luna Expedition. They didn't, Columbia Plain wasn't manufactured after, there, there's the piece Is on screen. It? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Looks, it, It's really exciting, isn't it? But <laughs> well, but when you say ex Columbia Plain to another archeologist, oh, it is yeah. exciting, correct? I, 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 it is very exciting. Um, all this stuff is very exciting to, to folks who know what it is, you know? And so I called Jan again and said, you know, I've, I'm holding Columbia Plain, and she later told me that she had a heart attack mm -hmm. and called Elizabeth again and called John again. Um, I'll let John tell his story. The, 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 um, the folks that owned the property were, were busy with other events um, when he called, so it was tough to get a hold of them, but I'll let John tell that story. But anyway, that's how I found it. So I was prepared. I mean, years before, I had made sure I understood what Luna era artifacts looked like, and I knew the Luna story, and I was familiar with, with where it might be. There's a number of locations around the bay that it could have been based on some of the early descriptions, but um, part of it was just pure luck and driving by the lot at the right time when the lot was cleared. Well, and going back in three weeks and still seeing that, I'm sure something must have gone through your head. Yeah, what went through my head was, what is going on, guys? This is, you know, and, and what was going on is they, they were trying to get permission from the landowner, which is very appropriate to do. Absolutely. Um, but, but I thought at that point um, it, the artifacts needed to be collected for safekeeping because construction could start or a kid could come and pick it up and throw it across the road or who knows what. And so I went ahead and did that. And in fact, on the screen is, is the collection of Spanish artifacts that I found initially um, in the surface collection. And I, I took those to the university. There were about 100 artifacts total that I'd found at that point, half of them Native American sherds and half of them um, Spanish, you know, as it turns out, 1559 to 1561, Tristan Delena. I think I heard that that um, same area had been maybe Indian burial grounds or something. Is well, that, that a rumor? There, were, there was an archaeologist um, named S.T. Walker. He was from Milton. Um, he published a newspaper up there. And he wasn't an archaeologist by today's standards, but for his day he was, he was considered a... a professional archaeologist, and he did note some Indian burial mounds in the area, but he didn't write anything about them. They apparently weren't very interesting to him, but otherwise he would have written a description of them. They were somewhere close by, but the map is so, you know, non-descriptive that it will never find them based on that map, and they may or may not be right there. They may 
be just out of the way. We don't know. So these weren't pieces that were mixed in. This would have no, been maybe no, things no, no, that they no. traded you, with you the don't, you don't Indians. Find, and, and I'll let John talk about this okay. in more detail, but mm -hmm. you don't find Spanish ceramics in Native American, Native American burial context of this time period. You, you just don't it see just that. It just doesn't happen. No, this is not Native American mm -hmm. burials. No way. So in other words, if you hadn't gotten that, there's a good chance that tractors could have come back in and smushed it all up even Yeah, more. and 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 you know, some of the artifacts might have been damaged or lost and 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 so forth. And the big thing is is that would have anybody would anybody have noticed that the site was there? People have been finding the lunacite for decades, I'm certain of it, but they've been picking up these nondescript pieces of brown pottery and white pottery and orange pottery and promptly throwing them in the trash, right? Because it doesn't look like much. Yeah, I, had, I talked to one fellow that grew up in the neighborhood. He said when they were kids, they used to find pottery and skip it across the bay. Oh. He was embarrassed. I yeah. told him not to worry about yeah. it. Don't, you don't want to tell that to too many people, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all right. Look, yeah. it's yeah. a big site. Uh -huh. There's a lot more to find. It, it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And um, here we've got some pictures of some work that will probably be coming up similar to this in the, in the coming years, some of what you learned, right? Right. This is the first excavation that we did. We got permission from the property owners, and we wanted to get in ahead of construction, and so we didn't get in the builder's way, and the builder wasn't in our way, and it worked out perfectly, and, and this is that first excavation over a weekend. I think they turned out everybody in the university to come that day because um, we had a lot of folks there and got a lot of work done. And um, yeah. that was the initial initial work that was done at the site. So more of that will be going oh, on. Oh, certainly. It's one thing you mentioned to me was that there is treasure there, but not really treasure. So no, there, you want to clarify one that? Of the, maybe one of people's favorite questions is, "Well, are, I'll split the gold with you." And I tell people, "Look, when we find gold, I'll give all of it to you." Mm -hmm. And they and I say to them, "You know why I say that?" And they go, "Because there's not any gold." And I go, "That's right. There's not any gold. Right. This is not a treasure expedition. There are treasure fleets that have gold and silver and jewels and all that stuff. The Luna fleet was not that. Those treasure fleets are like." armored cars going back to Spain, the Luna fleet is like a moving van. <laughs> it's going to have dishes have and furniture day. and tools and supplies and so forth. And you're right, to archaeologists and, and to the public eventually, those are real treasures, but it's not treasure like gold and silver. That's just, that's not what this is. Let's talk about the neighbors. They've been very great in working with you, and you're now the liaison for the whole neighborhood. Well, I, I wasn't working for the university at the time that this all happened, and <coughs> Elizabeth Benchley, um, Dr. Benchley, who is in charge of the entire archaeology program at the university, she recognized pretty quickly that I like to talk. Um, <laughs> she also recognizes that I'm good at explaining to folks how archaeology works. Um, I'm not a professional archaeologist. I took a field school. I worked in it for a while, and then my life took me in different directions. But I do understand how it works. I like to tell people what's going on. So my job is to explain to the neighborhood and visitors to the site what we're doing and what the future is, to get permissions to excavate. There's like 150 properties in the neighborhood, so it's a lot of folks to talk to, and so it's a valuable role that I play in doing that. I like to say that, that I can't tell who's more excited, the archaeologist or the neighborhood. The neighbors are incredibly excited about this. There's, there's talk of, you know, who's got bragging rights about living in the oldest neighborhood in the United States. Oh, yeah, so of course. they're very excited. Well, that's wonderful. And, and they've the been efforts. very gracious and very generous in allowing us access to the properties. This is their private space, and, and um, we, we want to be sure and recognize that. And they've, they've been very good to us and very supportive of what we're doing. Absolutely, and I know everybody wants to just keep that uh, low until at such time it might be appropriate, but right, um, right. there are plenty of places to see these art artifacts that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we're going to be going to a break in just a minute, but tell me very briefly, how did you get so interested in history and how has your life just changed as a result of this? I found an old bottle when I was 18 or 19 years old. It was a Hygieia Pensacola Bottling Works Coca-Cola bottle. I found it in a clay pit just messing around. I took it to the Old Christ Church um, Pensacola Historical Museum to Norman Simons. He told me what it was and then from that point on every little piece of stuff I found I'd take it down to Norman and say what is it? Who made it? How old is it? How do you know? And, and that's how I get started. As far as changing my life, I never expected this. I mean, it, you know, it, in addition to, to getting a part-time job out of this, it's just <laughs> we're kept busy with people asking for interviews and wanting us to speak to groups, which is wonderful, but like I say, we're kept busy. It, the, the response has been phenomenal, and it's all been positive. 
it's just been fantastic. You've got lots of work to do, and it'll be fun to talk with you about it with Dr. Worth here in just a moment. So I hope you'll stay right here with us. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, we're going to take a break right now, and then when we come back, Tom and I will be joined by Dr. John Worth, who is the principal investigator for the Tristan de Luna settlement site. Stay with us. The true measure of all our actions is how long the good in them lasts. This is who I am, where I'm from. If you're on the right side of history, you can accomplish anything. It's a connection between your present and your past. Come this way. This is good. This is very good. We are attempting to fulfill the promise of America. The stories about who we are shape us. This chance to go through a time machine. Good heavenly day. We should know our history. It informs, but it doesn't constrict you. It's a framework to carry out human activity. The sky is the limit. This started a long time ago. Dr. John E. Worth joins us now to give us his thoughts on this amazing discovery. Dr. Worth is Associate Professor of Historical Archaeology in the Department of Anthropology at the University of West Florida. He specializes in archaeology and ethnohistory, focusing on the Spanish colonial era in the southeastern United States. Dr. Worth has an extensive background in public archaeology program administration in both Florida and Georgia and has been a member of the faculty at UWF since 2007. And there he is at one of those press conferences or the press conference. So, uh, Dr. Worth, with that uh, background, you certainly are in the right place at the right time, obviously, in history. So welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me. We're so glad to have you here tonight. And um, you're a busy man these days, <laughs> as is Tom, as we just talked about. And so taking this time to share this with the public is just very important. And we are all very grateful for that. So, press conference. He calls you. What happens? Or somebody from the department calls you after he calls them. Tell me your side of this story. Well, uh, I did get a, a text message essentially from uh, Dr. Elizabeth Benchley um, saying that Jan Lloyd had been informed by a uh, former student of Dr. Benz's, Tom Garner, and that there were some 16th century or potentially 16th century ceramics showing up in what I have and many others have always considered a high probability location for the Luna site. Um, so initially it was basically my job to go ahead and reach out to the landowner and so uh, I did. I reached out, contacted the landowners who were very, very gracious but were involved in, in the process of actually having a, a child uh, at the time. So we had uh, some time passed essentially and over the course of the next few weeks uh, eventually I was able to make contact with the landowners further and uh, of course Tom rediscovered uh, the materials that he had found earlier that were still lying around. So ultimately, the point, though, is that when the collection was finally made and brought into the Laboratory of Archaeology uh, on the UWF campus, uh, Tom was there, and we had trays with all of the Spanish material, and we had the Native American material. And I remember being coming up and looking at the materials, and it's unlike anything else uh, we've ever found in Pensacola. I mean, there, there are no other assemblages that look like this precisely. 
Uh, there's a lot of Spanish material. We have three separate presidios that date to the 18th and late 17th century, but the 16th century stuff is distinctive. And it wasn't just a little bit. It wasn't one or two pieces. Mm -hmm. It was a whole tray full of this stuff. And I remember just being increasingly floored by what I was looking at. Um, and so we were talking among, among each other and kind of trying to say, yeah, this is what it looks like, right? And we were going back and forth. And ultimately, uh, I, I had to conclude that we had a really good shot that this was actually the settlement of Tristan de Luna. Um, now, I'm going to tell on John here. Uh, when, he says, <laughs> when he says they had to conclude, um, what John means is he stopped for a minute, he breathed out a, a big breath and said, Holy moly! <laughs> and I think that is a uh -huh. professional archaeological term for it. So, yeah. so it's a, that's the best description of an archaeological uh, site I've ever heard. I can, I, I can only imagine uh, the flies on the wall must have enjoyed <laughs> that very much. That is just um, perfect. Um, because it sounds to me like a lot of people probably contact you and you've researched sites all over the country, and in fact, I think you might have been looking at one this past weekend. Somebody <laughs> called you about. We won't get into that. But so the point is, though, that you do this a lot. And so when you probably got the initial call, did you have any feeling about it one way or another, or was it that moment when it hit? Well, before I saw the artifacts, I was, of course, thinking, well, one or two pieces of pottery. It's probably going to be pieces that are ambiguous, that we're not 100 percent sure about. Um, and that's usually the way it goes. We see one or two pieces of something that could be the right time period, maybe not, maybe it's in bad context, but ultimately when I saw the assemblage, and again, it was what, what floored me about the assemblage of, of artifacts that came off of that surface collection, and that's not even counting what we later found during testing at the same site, is that it's so much 16th century ceramics, and it's really the only explanation is that it's Luna's settlement. Uh, it is the hottest dense concentration of 16th century Spanish materials in the entire northern Gulf Coast so far ever found. And not only that, it's exactly the kind of assemblage of artifacts that relates to the settlement. And so, uh, again, it, it really did become clear that I was sort of hesitant to jump to conclusions, but I was astounded to think that literally over the next few days, we, when we got permission to actually go and do testing, that we might actually be looking at finding the site, exploring the site, and learning about this long lost expeditionary camp that everybody's been looking for for decades and decades, and in fact, longer than that. So we just saw some uh, red glazed earthenware, I believe, and now this is... We're looking here at pieces of really what the clincher of the argument is, is that this is non-local but American Indian pottery, and it's not local stuff, it's Aztec. Um, Tristan de Luna brought along about 200 Aztec warriors and craftspeople, and these ceramics are red film, they're very well made, the paste is very odd for the local Native American ceramics, and it's got this sheen sort of uh, black graphite paint in decorations. Again, all of it is totally exotic for our area. And that's the one thing that the Luna expedition had that no other Spanish expedition throughout the entire history of Spanish Florida had was a contingent of Mexican Indians from downtown modern Mexico City brought along who lived here for about a year or so before they themselves evacuated. Um, and it, it, it's essentially the clincher that it's not just 16th century Spanish, but it's Luna. Yeah, that's amazing. I also amazing. say the, the size of the site is another clue to what it is. The, the site, as far as archaeological sites go, it's humongous. It's gigantic. It goes for square blocks mm -hmm. and square blocks. And if you think about that, that fits very well, the 1,500 people. Uh, somebody said the other day, there's not 1,500 people living there now. And that's true. Um, so the size of the site, the artifacts that were coming out, the sheer number of artifacts that were coming out are all very good indications that this is, is in fact the settlement and the shipwrecks being close by. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, John, is it something that um, that we feel the need to prove or it's only for someone to disprove? I mean, what is what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's still up to us uh, as professional scientific archaeologists to build the case um, and, you know, find not only the assemblage of artifacts, but find them in good context. Um, do mapping and get the exact provenience, find them in sealed, undisturbed underground context, pit features and all of that. So in other words, we're still going to have to build a very, very strong case. Um, but I really don't feel any hesitation at all in concluding that this really is the Luna settlement because of the various things that we've been talking about. The nature of the assemblage is clearly colonial. It's got Aztec pottery. It's a huge site, precisely what we would expect. Um, and it's, it's in the location that 
frankly, best matches the textual descriptions we have. I've read all of the Luna accounts, essentially everything that we know of from the Luna expedition. And when I walked out on the site the very first time, I remember Tom took me down to the shore, uh, the bluff, and we looked out and I kind of looked at the span of the, of the bay and the positioning of everything, the, the height of the peninsula, the level position. Everything matches. It was almost like a magic moment when I was seeing the site for the first time through the eyes of what I had read previously. And oh. it's just, at this stage, even though we're still going to build our case, we're going to submit it to peer review and let everybody in our profession look at it and you know see our evidence, I think it's frankly up to someone who would say that this is not Luna to say it's something else. It would, it would be up to them to prove that it's not the Luna site because, frankly, it's the only thing that matches the substantial evidence that we have. Well, and I think as an archaeologist and, and one with the background that you have, I think that it's pretty clear that it is, and that's just <laughs> what I'm going to say and what do I know. But why should somebody that's watching tonight care about this? What, what, does, it, what does it mean? Oh, goodness. Oh. This is the first multi-year European settlement in the United States. It predates St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, of course, it didn't last as long as St. Augustine, so St. Augustine is still the first permanent European settlement, but it predates St. Augustine, Florida. It was also staged from Mexico, modern-day Mexico. So it represents a snapshot, and a pretty substantial one, of a really important era in the first stages of attempted colonization, European arrival in North America. And it's a huge step. Uh, even though it failed, it was a huge step in the Spanish attempt to settle Florida. And it's been missing from the history books. Um, and what we learn from this site will give us insights into the nature of Europeans who chose to come to this unexplored, by them, unexplored land to interact with the native groups here, uh, to set up shop and attempt to build houses and live there for a little while. Of course, a hurricane sort of set that back. But regardless, it's going to give us a new window into an important phase of early American settlement that has yet to be told and, and deservedly should form a part of American history in general. And um, what are we looking at right here? Well, can I interrupt real quick? Sure. Um, the other part, as a Pens mm -hmm. native Pensacolian, this site has been part of Pensacola's history but also mythology for over a hundred years when the first English account of this expedition was published here locally. Um, we've got the Fiesta of Five Flags, we had the Quadricentennial, the 400th anniversary um, back in 15, uh, 1959, we had the 450th anniversary in 2009. Tristan de Luna runs through Pensacola every which way. There's a thread that runs through everything and we've got bowling alleys and streets and <laughs> what have you named, named for him. So to find this site for, as a Pensacolian and for Pensacolians, it makes it real. It's no longer a myth, and I think that's very important, and I think that explains a great deal of the excitement. We've been wanting to find this for, everybody's been wanting to find this um, consciously or subconsciously for a long, long time, and now we finally did. I think myth to um, certainty is, is kind of what we're looking at here. It sounds to me, guys, like the stars were a bit aligned on this. What do you think? I definitely agree. This is one of those things where I sort of always knew that it would be found by accident because it hadn't been found yet. Um, but everything not only coincided in terms of Tom finding it and us having opportunity, the landowners being so gracious and willing for us to come out and explore it, but not only that, um, the university itself has sort of incidentally assembled a team of scholars, researchers, and students trained under those same researchers that we are at UWF uniquely qualified, I think, to be able to spearhead this investigation. Um, not only has the UWF been working on the shipwreck sites for literally decades, uh, but we've now got a team of people, um, including myself, I've worked on Spanish colonial Florida for the better part of three decades. Um, and so we're all essentially prepared for this. And it's just the fact that it happened on our watch right now and we get to actually do this exploration is just I don't know, beyond belief to me, it's, kind of it's phenomenal. Yeah, as, as the person that discovered this, I, I turned it to the, over to the university um, knowing that it was in good hands. These guys are not the minor, minor leagues. This is the World <laughs> Series, and, and they're very, it's very appropriate that they um, investigate this site. Absolutely, and I'm looking forward to coming back and exploring that with um, John just a little bit more. Thank you, Tom, and I'll, I'll enjoy that conversation coming up in just a few minutes. Okay, so interesting, very interesting. We're going to delve a little bit deeper with Dr. Worth and discuss the far-reaching implications this discovery has right after the break. Don't go away.
American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. SkillsUSA is a national organization. It partners with business, industry, educators, and students because what we're trying to achieve is to have a skilled workforce. I'm going to school for heating and air conditioning with HVAC. That's where you learn how to work on air conditioners and refrigerators and walk-in coolers and anything to do with refrigeration. Skills USA promotes teamwork, leadership, citizenship, character development, and creates an environment that encourages students to complete their educations and plan a career path. Well, the most rewarding thing is to have students to be successful. Watching students start from um, in the beginning, coming here from either high school or another college, and uh, being successful within their program, finding that um, things were a little bit easier going through their program because they had Skills USA uh, to help them to be the best that they can be. So not only are you uh, becoming the best that you can be in your career field, but you're proving those skills in front of business and industry partners that are going to hire you for jobs in our future. Skills USA has helped me really step up my performance a lot more and be the best at my trade that I can be. Skills USA at Pensacola State College, helping students discover a world of possibilities. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. to address this question to Dr. John Worth. There have been a number of tremendously significant findings made by the UWF Archaeology Department over the years, so we're going to talk about the important work that is continuing and also give some insight as to future implications within the big picture of the most recent investigation. So having said all of that, how does one become interested in the Spanish colonial period, and you've been all over the Southeast. Sit, tell me about your story. Goodness, uh, I've been telling people I was going to be an archaeologist since I was something on the order of 10 years old. So I've always had an interest in the past and sort of sharing the first sight of, of what this place looked like and understanding more about the past. And I guess I was actually more interested in deep prehistoric Native Americans, American Indian stories. Um, that was what I was always going to do. And ultimately, when I went to the University of Georgia back in the mid-80s, I found that one of my future professors was actually researching the, the route of Hernando de Soto around through the southeast. And I sort of piggybacked on that. And uh, ultimately, by getting involved in that project, searching about Spanish presence among the Native Americans I was interested in, I sort of gradually got more and more interested in the Spanish period. And fortunately, I had uh, a background in Spanish. My mom, who wasn't a native Spanish speaker, but she nonetheless majored in that and, and got her master's degree in it. So she had taught me and other members of my elementary school uh, the basics of Spanish. So I, I knew enough Spanish to be able to actually dive into the documents. And so thanks to that background and my interest in archaeology, I eventually chose to go to the University of Florida, where we have a really, really remarkable archive of materials relating to Spanish Florida. So I decided that I was simply going to specialize in not just the archaeology of colonial Florida, but also the history, the ethno-history uh, using the documents. Instead of just being able to dig and rely on historians or just looking at the documents and relying on archaeologists, I figured I would actually do both. And so that's what I followed up on. Ethno-history, so you're looking at how the people lived and, and you're, you find things from these things that are taken out of the ground that can give you clues as to that? Well, I look at, um, and I teach my students that basically, if we're going to study the past, particularly of this colonial period, um, there are material traces that require interpretation to understand. And there are documentary traces, which are windows into the minds of the people of the past, but they still include people's biases, their agendas, sometimes outright lies. And so the only way really to get a good multifaceted view, a more accurate view of what happened in the past, is to have both the documents and the archaeological traces. And that's exactly what I try to do. And this Luna expedition is a good example of that, is that we have a fragmentary and partial record from the documents and we've, what we've needed is the archaeological material to be help fill in all that. And they each help, each, uh, the, one side, the archaeology and the documents, they, 
they sort of inform each other and, and gradually we get more information about each until we get a more robust picture of what went on in the past. And you're certainly getting a more robust picture in that it's within view, as you said, of the shipwrecks and that's another big thing that um, the university has been involved with. Let's talk a little bit more about the department mm -hmm. and the big projects that have been brought to light uh, really in the last 30 years or so and you've been there what since 2007 so. This is my ninth year at the UWF. Um, I was really happy to be hired uh, when Judy Bentz was still our department head. There she is. Uh, Judy um, started essentially the the program that we have today over the course of her career since the early 80s she's been building and growing both the UWF archaeology team, the Department of Anthropology, the Division of Anthropology and Archaeology that I work in uh, and sort of an outreach program about public archaeology here in Pensacola and in fact it was the team that she assembled and the program that she with her colleagues put together uh, that I actually wanted to come work for. So the reason I'm here in, in large part is because of this remarkable team and now what we have is Archaeologists who do both terrestrial archaeology and maritime or underwater archaeology. Uh, we have now the fourth of four major Spanish settlements during the pre-1763 era. And uh, all of this has resulted in remarkable knowledge about both the material culture, the archaeological remains, and also the documentary trace and how all that fits into a bigger picture, picture of uh, Pensacola's history. And you know, the one thing about the 16th century explorations that UWF focuses on that to me is most important is that we've got a remarkable underwater site, the Emmanuel Point 1 and 2 shipwrecks, which are currently being excavated by our two maritime archaeologists, Dr. Greg Cook and Dr. John Bratton. And they've been working on this for many, many years. And we have a number of students working on it. And the interesting thing is that that's the ships that were offloaded to the terrestrial site. And so when the hurricane hit, that, of course, destroyed the rest of the ships and sank their remains, but we've always been missing the terrestrial part of the settlement in order to understand more fully both the ships and the terrestrial side. So uh, we've got now this amazing team, amazing laboratories, a great team of uh, graduate students who are all working together as a part of this effort, um, and people are coming out of the woodwork to try to help us and offer their, their advice and consultation. So I don't know, I'm just so excited because it's all going to come together here with this Luna site. Uh, and we'll literally be doing archaeology on the land in view of where our underwater archaeologists will be diving on a ship from the same period. And the picture we were just looking at, I believe, was an olive jar that has ties to the ship um, as well. And what are we looking at in this slide right here? Well, these are uh, pieces of lead-glazed coarse earthenware, uh, some of which came off of the Emanuel Point One shipwreck. Um, so there's a tremendous and large uh, number of uh, fragments of pottery and everything from anchors and uh, large cooking pots, copper cauldron, that kind of thing, which has already been found and which is actually on display at the Archaeology Institute on the UWF campus. Um, so we already had displays, public outreach uh, down at the Wentworth Museum, uh, so a long history and a large collection. And now that we're getting materials off the terrestrial site, we will be analyzing the little bitty fragments that we find in comparison to the larger fragments of bigger vessels, uh, pottery vessels that have been found on the shipwrecks, and we'll be better able to sort of reconcile the two and see what happens, for example, when something's been buried underwater for 450 years as opposed to up on land, and we'll do all sorts of archaeological science and, and put it all together, you know, working as a team couple of things I want to point out and one is that this is just getting started. It's not, I mean, it's not like this happened two months ago. This is just the very beginning of this find, correct? It is. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the most important things to realize is that even though we have indeed found enough to say that we do have the site, uh, we are literally just beginning to explore that site. And as Tom mentioned a few minutes ago, the site itself occupies multiple city blocks uh, literally more than a hundred landowners. It's a nice residential neighborhood and so we're just kind of gradually working our way through contacting landowners, soliciting their permission and their interest and support and it will take us literally months, probably several years, even to begin to finish out testing. Our first goal is to bound the site, find out how far the Spanish material spreads and if there's any hot spots or gaps like the plaza in the middle of the settlement. Um, and then eventually this summer, we'll be doing our first 10-week field school with students actually learning to do archaeology by participating in our more intensive excavations in certain areas of the Luna site. And that's probably going to happen this year as well as next year, 
To be perfectly frank, I'm guessing that a large chunk of my, the rest of my career will be dedicated to focusing on the Luna site. It's I was going to say. And this is from the shipwreck, I believe, as well? Yes, that's a piece of a plate that came off the wreck uh, with samples of the stuff that came off the terrestrial site. The same type, but the staining on the, on the larger piece is from the underwater environment, which makes it look different, but it's actually the same. And we could go on about this for days. Some, uh, somebody that's interested just needs to take one of your classes, I think, or get in <laughs> one of your field schools, which will be um, going on for a while. But I was going to say, how has your life changed, and how will it change, and how will this look in history books, I think, down the road? Wow. Well, I, I can say that ever since that fir first uh, contact back in October and the excavations in November, um, it's been a whirlwind. I've, I have been busier than I think I've ever been in my whole life in a good way. I mean, it's, it's keeping us busy. All of us are running around this way and that. The interest has been just overwhelming. Um, the public interest here locally, but also the media interest, uh, the scholarly interest is just kind of beginning to trickle in. So uh, it's definitely changed my life in that I'm now sort of focusing on Luna. I'm finally having an opportunity, if not the time, to dive into the documents of the Luna expedition even more intensely than I had before. Um, so long term, I think this is definitely going to be a major uh, new phase of my professional career and sort of the culmination of decades of work that I've been doing, even tracking Luna for something like 17 years since trying to look for one of his sites up in North Georgia. So, so you've been tracking him, and this is—I have. I mean, and here it is. I know that's that's kind of amazing. Uh, the the professor, one of my original mentors, Charlie Hudson, who's passed away not too long ago from the University of Georgia, was on the trail of Luna up in Georgia, where his, one of his detachments went. And uh, I, I wish he were still around to be able to learn that we have finally found the actual settlement from which those expeditions were sent. I, I don't know. It's just really remarkable how it all sort of played into what we have now, which is this great opportunity. I feel he probably knows about it, and he's probably probably smiling from ear to ear as you are. And it sounds to me like the stars aligned and right archaeology department, right person, right discoverer. Everything just worked out the way it was supposed to, and we're um, anxious to find out more from you in the future. Well, I'd like to, like to think that we're going to continue to produce even more information. This is literally just the beginning. Um, we're going to make discoveries there. We're going to hopefully find evidence of structures, house areas, activity areas, learn about the Aztecs, for which we don't even have any more than just first names. So much left to come. I mean, this is, there's going to be more to this story. Very exciting. And you've written a lot of books and scholarly papers and all, of, and so we'll look for something from this, I'm sure. Very definitely. Dr. John Worth, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Best of luck, and we'll talk thank to you, you in the future. Well, when... Uh, there's no doubt that we're going to be hearing so much more about this in the months and years to come. And we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come right back and be joined by public historian and community advocate Nancy Fetterman. She's going to talk about another influential Spaniard of national note, Bernardo de Galvez. Please stay tuned. real thing. This is where we were born. One of the amazing things about the history of life on Earth is it keeps learning new tricks. The animals, plants, no, it gets in your blood. Everything's interconnected. We've got to begin to tell a new story, a story about interaction. It's something that really touches my heart. There's just massive life everywhere. It's just magic.
Welcome back. As I mentioned, Nancy Fetterman is a public historian and community advocate who has spent years researching Bernardo de Galvez. Uh, she began her research in 2007 and has been a student, employee, and trustee of the University of West Florida, which fits right in. Nancy has served on many local and state boards and done so much for our community. Now, when Nancy and I joined Honorary Vice Consul Maria Davis in Spain in 2012, it was uh, the connection that we gained from understanding the importance of General Galvez to the Spanish that sparked a decision to try one more time to make General Galvez an honorary citizen of the United States. And now the rest of the story. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Thank so, you for asking me. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're here. You, you have been so interested in Galvez. How did that start? And how did that work in with that trip that we did take with um, Maria Davis? Wasn't that fun? Fabulous. Well, it's, I was thinking as the gentlemen were speaking now, you know, 200 years later, another Spaniard made a difference in our country. So um, I think what we, when you and I were in Spain, I think it just uh, made me realize how important it, Spain is to this part of the world. And um, when you look back at 200 years after De Luna's visit, what, what it established uh, in America was just an amazing settlement period along the eastern coast of all the 13 colonies. And then, of course, there was Spain, and there was Britain that was kind of taking over. But Bernardo Galvez was interesting to me just because of, of what he did. He was a a really bright young man. It, he was uh, the a major general in New Orleans, having come from vice, Viceroy in uh, Mexico. They called it New Spain. And he immediately understood that when, in 1776, when the Americans wanted to declare their independence from Britain, that he was, wanted to get involved. And he was indeed asked uh, by General Washington if they could, if they would be interested. And, and there were lots of uh, back and forth there between the French also and the Spanish. So it was sort of an interesting, uh, I just found that very interesting to see how that all came together. Because Dr. Clune out at the university often said that really the Spanish should have had the 14th colony, which it, it was really the first colony of America compared to anything else. But Bernardo Galvez was an interesting man, and when we were in uh, Spain, it, it just came back to me. Well, when we were in Spain, we saw things such as his hometown, mm -hmm. and we saw them have a celebration there. Tell me about that. Wasn't that something? Well, in 2007, I had been uh, asked by Molly Long, uh, Marianne and Don Long's daughter, who is now living in Spain, married to a naval mm -hmm. officer, and she said that this country is crazy. They don't even care about Luna. Forgive <laughs> me, gentlemen. They, they really like Galvez. And uh, he, she said... We think we would like, we the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution in Spain would like for you to do something about getting him an honorary citizenship. And I said, Molly, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. So so what happened was I, I researched how, how many people had been honorary citizens of America. There were seven. But then I saw that Pulaski of Poland was an honorary citizen. Uh, his contemporaries made him one. And then uh, also the Marquis de Lafayette. So the French were already there. The Poles were already there. And I thought, well, it's only right that Bernardo Galvez. So I said, well, let me see what I can do. So I, so I called um, uh, Congressman Miller's office and said, this is kind of what we'd like to do in Pensacola. We think he's pretty important. And he patted me on my head and said, It'll never happen. There, there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But so, but I, I went ahead and wrote an argument, and I, I got the governor to give me a supportive letter, and, of course, the mayor and everybody. But uh, it went nowhere. And then when we went to our trip and went to Macharavillaya, the city where Galvez was born, that galvanized me. Yeah. I, I saw how important he was and how important they thought he was to the American Revolution. And I went back and I did a little bit more research and I thought, they're right, he deserves it. So I started again uh, with uh, Jeff Miller and we went all along the Gulf Coast. I have connections in Texas. And we decided all of the people that would have been involved in this period of time, 
really need to get on board. And so when Jeff Miller introduced this, um, I wrote the argument for it with a, lo a lot of scholars out at the university, all get giving me ideas for, for it. I got the governor to support it, and all all of the uh, all of the congressmen and all of the senators in in our state gave them um, letters. So it it really was a powerful thing. At the same time, a young woman, a Spanish woman, found out a, a letter that Rousseau had written one of uh, the captains of the Galvestown that came into Pensacola during the Battle of Pensacola uh, had promised uh, uh, Galvez a portrait would always remain in the Congress of the United States. So all of that sort of happened together. So when we, when we sent the argument up there and it was tweaked by the historians up there, it was approved unanimously. I'm sure, and mm -hmm. we've got some sites here in Pensacola that yes. um, that show give a snapshot of um, of Galvez in this mm -hmm. area. But t talk about him, the man, and and in Macharavilla, the the um, the party that they have on the Fourth of July, and how um, important that is, and how how much sense it really makes. Well, as you know, they did a reenactment of the the. Battle of Pensacola, which many consider the longest battle of the American Revolution, because the, by by the time uh, uh, George Washington was nearing uh, Yorktown, he understood that his western and southern flank were at risk, and the British were sending up supplies from through Mississippi up the Ohio River, so he had to stop that. And the only way he could do it, he felt, was to get the Spanish involved, who had just given up this part of Florida a few 20 years earlier. So so the Spanish really wanted it. And Galvez was just a, a remarkable man. He was only, I think he was 30, 31, when he became the uh, militia, militia general. And then he said, he went to his troops and said, we need your help to take these forts along the mm -hmm. way, and Battle of Pensacola is the biggest one. But when, at the, at the Machiavellia show, they did. They reenacted the Battle of Pensacola. And remarkable. Uh, just they it's like the Fourth of July is so important to them mm -hmm. because that's their native son and he's just so um, integral to this mm -hmm. area and to the United States history. That's right. Um, how do you think history books are going to be rewritten as of um, some of this happening and people learning more? And and honestly, um, Nancy, why should people care? That's a great question. That's exactly a great question. I just think I just think it tells the culture and and the heritage of a town. I think I think people that come here from Michigan and uh, all of Canada they don't have any idea of what was involved in this little area and how old it is with the Luna uh, uh, shipwrecks. It's it's really an opportunity to tell our story, and I think it's going to be a very important one. Right now, the Pensacola Heritage Foundation has partnered with the city of Pensacola, and they've commissioned a maquette. I think you have a picture of the maquette we have uh, started uh, and given us a, uh, a place downtown uh, on the way to the fort that will be a life-size statue of the general, and, and, and we think that helps tell those stories. You know, all the great uh, cities and towns in Europe seem to have statues mm -hmm. of this type. Mm -hmm. And as I see our community loving itself more, I think projects that you are um, helping to bring mm -hmm. into play mm -hmm. um, add so much to this younger country. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a personal thank you there mm -hmm. because I'm excited to see this happen. So tell me how you're going to roll this out, what we can expect in well, the I'm months just, to Well, I'm just uh, one of the people that are helping with this project. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of this organization. This is the oldest organization in Pensacola. It's a nonprofit agency. They're the ones who started the preservation work around Seville. They did the Barclay House and they did evenings in Old Seville for 25 years. So they've been around for 50 years doing good works. And all of them are getting older now, and they said, we need to recruit new young people. But by doing so, they, they started thinking, let's have a project that everyone would enjoy. And because Bernardo Galvez was such an important part of this story, we felt he should be the first one. 
So we, we've gotten a lot of support from, from the church. Of course, when, when uh, countries came into to, uh, new countries, to, to develop countries, mm -hmm. they saw the church as a civilizing force. So immediately after the Battle of Pensacola, um, this English community suddenly had a Catholic church here, um, so named um, ecumenically by Galvez, you know, just saying, okay, now, Basil well, at the time it was not Basilica, St. Michael's, you are now the official church of Pensacola. So it, it's, there's so many stories that interrelate to Galvez and the battle and, and, and the Luna expedition. It's all just sort of part of the story of Pensacola. And, and heritage tourism is going to be the next big thing. It started in the 70s with all, you know, lots of, lots of work around. But uh, I think these scholars, people that really know how to tell a story and know what the story is critically, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Thanks to people like you and Dr. John Worth and Judy Benz Absolutely. and everybody, uh, we appreciate it and we look forward to more of the story, Nancy. Well, and it, it, it's the University yes. of Florida who made it all possible, yes. inspired all of us. And yes, thank you so much. Yes, Good thank to you. see you, Nancy. You too. We'll look forward to hearing more about that and the successful completion of that statue in uh, the months to come. So we want to thank Nancy Fetterman and our other guests this evening, Tom Garner and Dr. John Worth. And if you'd like to get more up close and personal with the history that we've discussed tonight, there are several sites that you may wish to visit to walk where Galvez walked and fought for America's freedom. There's Fort George Historic Site at the corner of North Palafox and La Rua Streets in downtown Pensacola. There you'll see a small section of reconstructed fort. We've shown you some pictures, a bust of General Galvez and a British cannon and much more. So if you'd like to see the life-size statue of Don Tristan de Luna, it's in downtown Pensacola as well, located at the foot of South Palafox Street near the water. The statue gazes out over a small park on the waterfront, and it certainly is a lovely time of year to get outdoors now that we've gotten through some bad storms that we've had recently. So to see more artifacts and learn more about this area's past through archaeology, be sure to visit the UWF Archaeology Institute. It's located at the entrance to the UWF campus. Hours are Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And if you'd like, you may wish to call ahead and arrange for a special tour by a UWF archaeologist. That's nice. The exhibits are free and open to the public and that number is 850-474-3015. Also, the T.T. Wentworth Jr. Florida State Museum contains so many artifacts and exhibits that you'll want to plan to spend as much time there as possible. The UWF Historic Trust Museum is located at 330 South Jefferson Street in downtown Pensacola. There's so much heritage tourism to see down there. A small admission is charged. Hours of operation are Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and Half Price Sunday happens each week from noon until 4. In two weeks, on our next In Studio, be sure to join host Drexel Gilbert. Drexel will be looking at some important environmental projects that are going on in our area. Again, I'd like to thank all of our guests this evening and you, the viewer, for joining us for this special edition of In Studio on WSRE. PBS for the Gulf Coast. I'll be back again soon on a future in studio. And in the meantime, I'll see you right in your own backyard. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. Good night.